Good morning, Pastor Dwayne here along with my beautiful bride, Cameron, and we are excited to be talking to you all this week about Psalm 91. This is a sword in your hand to go to spiritual battle in these days that we live in. I tell you that if you just look at the landscape of our nation and our world and the evil that is prevailing, it would be hopeless. It would be, we would feel helpless. But I promise you the words of Psalm 91, the words of this entire Bible, they are truth and they work. Mm -hmm. And what they've prophesied will come to pass. But Psalm 91 is just one of those very special mm -hmm. weapons that addresses, as you said yesterday, everything in life. You'll never go through anything in life mm -hmm. that this Psalm doesn't address. No. And I call this teaching a protocol of prosperity because um, it takes you from intimacy to invincibility to immunity yes. to increase. Yes. And promotion is the Lord's. But He's preparing our heart through the issues of life to be trustworthy of the time when He can bring increase into our life. So if you're discouraged, if you feel like there's no hope, if you feel like the enemy is totally won, God's people are left out in the cold, listen, you need to listen. Call someone that needs to be encouraged because this message works every time, all the time, every day in your life. We're going to bring that to you, but first we're going to pray. Sweetheart, will you pray for our viewers and listeners? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for having put in your word tools that we can use to totally transform our minds so that worry, doubt, and fear have no place anymore. Thank you for the words in this psalm, Father, that for me and for those out there who have taken this to heart and to mind and to body have said, this is what your word says, this is what we're standing on, this is what we know will come to pass. Father, thank you for words like this and many, many more. That The Bible is full of them, Father. Thank you for giving your word to your people. Thank you, Father, that it is alive in us. It is not just words on a paper, but it is alive yes. and it is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, we pray for those out there today that do not know your Son as their Savior, that they will be drawn to you today, that something we say will spark an interest in their hearts to receive your son to be changed to be transformed and to start living the life that they were intended to live when they were designed by you we thank you father for again blessing this nation we call this nation under god we yes. call this nation not divided but standing together for righteousness father we thank you that the remnant is beginning to stand up for you in this mm. nation amen Father, we pray a hedge of protection over our children. We have to protect our children, Father. And mm -hmm. I pray for parents out there worldwide mm -hmm. that they will have the gumption to stand up for righteousness yes, and yes, say yes. we're not having this in our school. We're not having this in our city. Father, let no, no one in this world ever have to go through the, the, the torment that... I think of oh, how Hitler came mm -hmm. in, Father, and, and that is very, looking how our situation is going, Father, how evil crept in, and before they knew it, they were taken over. Mm -hmm. We're not having it in this nation. Yes. We're not having Amen. it. The Lord rebuke this spirit that is trying to attack yes. this nation, and not just our nation, but the world around us as well, Father. We just ask for mm -hmm. supernatural protection, especially over our young people. Hallelujah. In your name we pray these things. Amen. 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 Thank you, sweetheart. You know, <clears throat> whenever I first came into the spirit-filled walk with God as a young man, young pastor, I'd like to say that my life got better. Things were excited. That the people were excited. But the truth of the matter is, is that I went through about a 10-year season of absolutely feeling alone, mm -hmm. of relationships being ripped apart to church strife and difficulty, <clears throat> trying to obey God, trying to follow Him. And I look back now, 25, 30 years later, mm -hmm. 
and I realized that I had to go through that process because the feeling of being alone drove me into a deep abiding intimacy with God. Mm -hmm. He is all I had. You know, Dr. Adrian Rogers used to say all the time in his messages, you'll never know God's enough until he's all you have. And I really was, I literally was in a place where he was all that I had. And <clears throat> I think we do people a real disservice when we um, make it seem like that everything in, Christ, in the Christian life is instant. Because we live in an instant society. Everybody wants it and wants it now. But real prosperity, now let me address that for a moment. Real prosperity. John says, I pray that you be in health and that you prosper even as your soul so prospers. That word prosper there means to have a good journey. Mm -hmm. God wants you to have a good journey. That's more than money. That's more than your bank account. Mm -hmm. Well, sure, if you're going to have a good journey, you can't have one if you're broke. And God wants to prosper you. But He wants to know that He can trust you. If God had given me what I wanted him to give me 25 years ago, it would have destroyed me. Right, me too. Because I didn't have the maturity to handle the full-on prosperity of God. Mm -hmm. The journey of Psalm 91, now think about this, put yourself in the context of it, is God called Moses. Here's a guy that was pulled out of the bulrushes, adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, He's now in the royal family. He discovers the fact that he's not an Egyptian, but a Hebrew. And out of his own compulsion and conviction, then he refuses to be raised in the house of Pharaoh, refuses to be loyal to him, is carried out in the wilderness. And God is telling him, guess what? You're going to go back to Pharaoh and you're going to be my deliverer and take my people out of 400 plus years of bondage. And Moses is like, but God, all I can do is stutter. And it was his intimacy with God that caused him to write this psalm. First experiencing in the cleft of the rock the glory of God passing by. But he took that experience and listen, it ruined him. When he got that close the Hebrew literally, when he says, I want to see your glory, God said, stand by me. And he spoke to him as a man speaks to a friend. Mm. I mean, he's deeply intimate with God. And that was the, literally the calling card of Moses' entire ministry. When he built the tabernacle, he would go in there and stay in there at the Ark of the Covenant. God said, I will meet you there. And the glory would cover him. So listen, step number one in your life is do not allow tribulation, tests, trials, suffering, hardships, what's going on in the world to drive you from God, mm -hmm. but to drive you deeper into God because that's where the promotion comes. And so we started it yesterday. <clears throat> I th when I think about this psalm, I think about my childhood. And I was the youngest of four and the only boy and spoiled rotten by my mother. She had wanted a son, prayed for a son. God gave her a son. I, locked, I always like to say my mom and dad tried it three times and finally got it right with me. Um, but I was a mama's boy, and the least little thing happened to me, I had a place to run, and that was her arms. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I think of this psalm, I think that's who our God is. He's where we run to when the hurts of life come, when the disappointments are there. No one could minister to me as a child like my mama could. Mm -hmm. And no one can minister to you in this life, in your adulthood, like the Father can. That's right. And so <clears throat> there's an old, old song, I won't quote it, but I think of when I think of Psalm 91, and that is that, that old psalm that says, there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God a place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God. That chorus says, O Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. That's a sweet, sweet old song.
But that's, that's what Psalm 91 is all about. And so <clears throat> let's talk about this place. First of all, it's a hiding place. Mm -hmm. He who dwells. The Hebrew says here, he who makes his home. Hmm. He who makes his home. The word dwell is where we get our English word dwelling. And so your home is your dwelling. Now, think about a home. I'm married to a uh, Holly homemaker here. Uh, this lady loves to create homes. She loves to make homes. She loves to be at home. She's all about home. She loves to cook. She loves to clean. She, I guess she loves doing laundry because she gets on to me if I try to help her. <laughs> she, she, you know, you made the statement, all you ever wanted to be was what? A wife and mama. And, and you are, and you're absolutely the best. <clears throat> but when you think about home, there are three characteristics of home. First of all, <clears throat> a home is a covenant place. Mm -hmm. That word dwell is where, if you, if you transliterate it into English, you, it, it's where we get our word dwelling or home. But in its core, in its root, this Hebrew word for dwell <clears throat> literally speaks to marital intimacy. Mm -hmm. It speaks to the formation of the covenant. We don't have to go further than that. You're an adult. You know what we're talking about, the consummation of the vows between a man and a woman on their wedding night. And with God, covenant's huge. And so the first thing we have to think about in Psalm 91 is, is that we have to make our home a covenant place of deep abiding intimacy with God the Father. Mm -hmm. It's a covenant relationship. That's right. It's not just a... <clears throat> our relationship with God the Father is not just a dating relationship. That's right. That's a good point. It, it's not just... Uh, a relationship where we come to him when we need him. That's right. But we dwell. We're, we're at home. That's good. A covenant place. It's also a comforting place. You know, a home, I, the home I grew up in was a place of unconditional love. Mm -hmm. Yes. Same thing with you. Mm -hmm. What do you think about when you think about home? What, Co cozy. That's her favorite word. <laughs> Cozy, that, that encompasses a whole lot. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a comforting place. Mm -hmm. The food that we grew up eating was comforting. Right. The presence of our mom and dad, our siblings. It's a place where you can be yourself. That's right. And so he who dwells, that, that, there's not a deeper, more intimate understanding than this covenant place and this comforting place. And it's also a consoling place. You know, uh, someone once said back there, you can't, you can't go home again. And um, in a sense, I guess that's true, at least for me. When I was 18 years old and I left home and I went to college and I never lived with my parents ever again. And so home was never what it was to me. But there was something always consoling about walking back into my mother's mm -hmm. house. That's right. About sitting down at her table. Yes. The, the comfort, the covenant, the unconditional love, the acceptance. <clears throat> and, you know, I, feel, I really feel for people who don't have that in their history, people mm -hmm. who didn't have that kind of home or that kind of lifestyle. Even though I didn't grow up there, it was the same way for me and my grandparents' house. Mm -hmm. I mean, I walk into my mamma Miller's house, and I was the only grandson in her life for a long, long, long time. I was grown by the time her next grandson came along. But uh, when I walked in her house, I was the center of attention. <clears throat> I had anything I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I had, and I gave it to... Uh, my grand Miller grandsons, my two grandsons with the last name Miller, I had her cookie jar that 
always in that cookie jar with those big lemon cookies about this big around. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you you didn't even have to ask. You I did ask, but you didn't have to ask. You could just take the lid off and that's home. Mm -hmm. And so many people approach God like he's way out there somewhere. Yes, that's true. And like, you know, <clears throat> I didn't grow up in a formal church, but when I first became a Southern Baptist, some of the churches I pastored in initially were very formal and very stiff. And, and I, I, I led those people to loosen up. And somehow, somehow people think that reverence is, is rigid. Mm -hmm. Stoic. But it's not. Um, so the first thing that you have to decide is that God's presence. Now listen, I understand that we have his presence continually in us. I, I know that we're indwelt by his presence. But I'm talking about a conscious daily effort and intention to enter into his presence consciously in his word, mm -hmm. through worship, in the spirit, coming in. It's a hiding place. He who dwells in the secret place. He who dwells. It's also a holy place. It's in the secret place of the most high God. And most high God here, of course, in Hebrews, El Elyon, most high meaning, and there's only one. It is his place. Notice the secret place is God's place. It's the Holy of Holies. This is referencing the Holy of Holies. It's his presence. It's referencing the Shekinah glory of God, where God told Moses, I will meet you there at the Ark of the Covenant. It is referencing a place of pardon where the mercy seat would be. And the blood would be applied. It's referencing his power. It's referencing his provision. And that ark was the manna from heaven that fed them in the wilderness and the mm -hmm. rod that Moses saw the miracles through. And it was the law of God that he gave him on Mount Moriah, on Mount, I mean, on Mount Sinai. And so here in that ark of the covenant where God's glory dwelled, <clears throat> you had the bread of life, the manna, you had the righteousness of God in the law, and then you had that rod of Aaron that budded, which was resurrection. Mm. So the holy place of God, he who makes his home, let me tell you how this, what this says in Hebrew. He who makes his home, the holy of holies, with God, will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. <clears throat> Here's the simplest translation. He who determines in his heart to make his home the Holy of Holies, he will find a home mm. with Almighty God or El Shaddai. Think about that. You shall, it's, 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 a, it's a holy place, it's a hiding place, it's a helpful place because he said, he who makes his home the Holy of Holies in the secret place of the Most High God. Think about this for a moment. <clears throat> Till Jesus shows up, no one can fully enter into the presence of God. Moses got as close or closer than anyone, mm -hmm. and then the high priest later on in the, in, the tab, in the temple. But the presence of God, the glory of the Shekinah dwelt on the other side of those cherubim on that ark. Mm -hmm. And Moses could get in front of the ark, but he couldn't go behind the ark, mm -hmm. or he would have died. That high priest could only go in there once a year on the Yom Kippur with hyssop and the blood atonement of a perfect sacrifice. And he could come to the front of the ark, but he couldn't go behind the ark. When the Bible says that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, you know what that means? It means he came out from behind the ark. Where we couldn't go in there to him, he came to us. Wow. So now the glory is no longer behind the ark. The glory is in Yeshua. And then the death of Jesus gave us his blood as a cleansing covering so that now that glory that would have killed us before now dwells in us. Mm -hmm. So he who dwells in the secret place where God did live, you now abide, have a home within you. <clears throat> That's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> where think about that. The same God that created the universe now dwells inside of us. Mm, wow. So it is a place 
it's a helpful place. It's a place of rest. Listen, he said, you shall abide. <clears throat> this word abide, I'm not trying to be too forward, but in Hebrew, it's, it's an intimate term. It means to, to tarry with one another all night as two lovers would. Mm -hmm. it, means, it means two people who are consummating their marriage and they talk now at a deeper level and they love at a deeper level and they are in each, they're, they're, they're one. Mm -hmm. And so this abiding is to tarry in God's presence. You know, that's what David and all of the people who wrote the Psalms, that's what they long for. You read the Psalms and what does David say? He said, as a deer pants for the water brook, my soul longs for you. You read in Psalm 63, oh my God, you're my God and early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you as a dry and thirsty land. Psalm 143, I stretch out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. So it's a place of rest. There is no greater comfort than the presence of God, than That's being true. in God's presence. Mm -hmm. It's a place of rest and refreshment. He said, you shall abide under the shadow and that's not rocket science. <clears throat> what does a shadow provide? Protection from the heat. A shadow provides... A covering. A covering. A cooling effect. Comfort. That's why David said, you walk through the valley of the shadow mm. of death and fear no evil. It's a place of reassurance. I love this. He who makes his home the holy of holies will find a home... Where? Under the shadow of the Almighty God, El Shaddai. El Shaddai is interesting when you look at it in its purest, purest form in Hebrew. It means burly, breasted one. That's El Shaddai, Almighty God. It, it means a place where you lay your head where you find that comfort and that, that caressing and you, you find that peace in the midst of anxiety and pain. I've got to try to finish this. He said, he who dwells makes his home, the Holy of Holies will find a home under the shadow of the big burly breasted God. Hmm. Wow. And so whenever that revelation came to Moses, he said... I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and in Him I will trust. He is my, listen to what He called God. He said He's my refuge, my confidant. I run to Him when I'm in trouble. He is my fortress, my comfort. I hide in Him in the midst of my trials. He is my God, my confidence. I hope in Him in the middle of tribulation. So, the key here to prosperity, to living in increase, is can God trust your heart? Mm -hmm. And you're looking at two people that have gone through some of the worst crises in life and instead of those driving us from him they drove us to him Yes. and we learned what the kisses of the father are Yes. I mean you've talked about um, when your husband passed away what God became to you mm -hmm. absolutely he became my husband and my best friend he filled that void. And he would fill, a, um, if you were an orphan, he could fill that void. There's children out there who've never had an earthly father. He can fill that void. He yes. can fill any void. He can be a, a spouse to a, a man. If a man loses his wife, same thing. He can be a, I don't want to use this term the way it sounds, a wife to a husband, but he can fill any void that you have in your heart, in your life. You have to reach a place in life where, and, th and believe me, this is not a <clears throat> concession of faith. This is not 
a false declaration. It is not a, it's not permission for anyone to live as a victim or in poverty. This is not a negative confession against faith. But when Job said, I will serve God though he slay me, he wasn't saying, God, just kill me. He was saying, I have so much trust in you. His wife's saying, curse God and die. Mm -hmm. And he's like, let me tell you something. I don't have anyone else to trust in. That's right. So even if he kills me, I'm going to trust him. That's that there's right. a, a greater purpose. Right. See, we have to get people to stop living life as, as if God is worshipped because of the outcome to say, in him will I trust. God is my refuge and my strength, my hope. He's my everything. In him will I trust means I'm trusting him regardless of the outcome. That's right. I tell people all the time, if you serve God because you, you if you serve God out of his conduct, you quit. Mm -hmm. But if you serve God out of his character, you will find that he is faithful. Yes. And that his promises and his prophecies don't have a shelf life. Mm -hmm. They don't have an expiration date. Mm -hmm. And if you just remain intimate and become more intimate and more intimate with yes. God, then you're going to wake up one day. It might be a year. It might be 10. It might be 20. It may be 30. It might be at the end of your life. Mm -hmm. And everything God's promised you, all that promotion, all that restoration, you're looking at two people who are living in the season of restoration. It's totally worth the wait. And we want you to have that. Don't miss tomorrow. We'll be right back here in Psalm 91 as we talk about invincibility. Once you're intimate with God, then you become invincible. We'll see you tomorrow right here on VTN.